Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is the 125th anniversary of the first Zionist Congress. There is no doubt in my mind that the most significant Jewish events of the past 125 years revolve around the founding of Zionism and the establishment of the Jewish state. No doubt, no debate, no question in my mind. The first Zionist Congress was magical. The attention that the Israeli and Jewish media have dedicated to commemorating the 125th anniversary of this momentous event, an event that took place during the last few days of August in 1897, a full 125 years ago in Basel, Switzerland, is well deserved. This singular gathering transformed the Jewish future. The first Zionist Congress set in motion events that changed the Jewish future. Those events have brought the Jewish world to today, to now, to this very moment. No one, not a single one of the 200 people who attended that first Congress could have envisioned the Israel of today. Not in their wildest imaginations could they have conceived of the miraculous, productive, creative, independent Jewish state called Israel. Theodor Herzl may have penned that famous diary entry that reads, in Basel, I founded the Jewish state. But he too had no idea that what he started would turn into the state of Israel today. 17 women were in attendance in Basel in 1897. That first year, women were not permitted to participate in the voting process. By 1898, by the second Zionist Congress, that slight was amended and women voted. For Herzl, this was not just a gathering of Jews, it was an event that needed to convey the grandeur of his dream. And so the Congress held its events at the Stadtcasino Basel, the Basel City Casino. Formal dress was required. That meant top hat, tails, white gloves, even at certain events, white ties. Over half the delegates at the first sign of this Congress were from Eastern Europe, where this style of dress was reserved for the aristocracy. While they were certainly uncomfortable with the dress, Herzl's intended message was well understood and carried through. The pictures show that indeed attendees were all frocked in formal attire. Some men wore their koppel, a big kippah, like a surgical scrubs hat. Seeing press coverage of Jews dressed like the powerful aristocracy and the leaders of the world pleased Herzl. He felt great pride in those images, but that feeling was not shared by certain other world leaders. It was because of those images that the leadership of Tsarist Russia conceived and drafted the infamous Protocols of the Elders of Zion. The contrived conspiracy about Jewish power after the photos of powerful looking, aristocratic looking, proud, self-assured Jews from 17 countries around the world gathered in Basel, Switzerland, gained the attention of the world in the press. It was not a gigantic leap to fabricate a conspiracy, a myth that Jews were plotting to control the world. That is, of course, the theme of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. The first sign of this Congress was more than about pomp and, and appearances. It was about securing the future of Jews from around the globe in their own home, in their own state, in the Jewish state. Its most important achievement was the adoption of the Basel Program. The first goal of the Basel Program was moving people, Jews, to Palestine. To accomplish this successfully, the program offered a second goal for Jews to live in groups which would provide strength and support. Goal number three was strengthening Jewish feeling and Jewish awareness, what we would call today Jewish identity. And finally, the fourth goal of the first Zionist Congress of the Basel Platform was negotiating with governments to facilitate Zionist goals. It was in Basel that Hatikva was adopted as an official anthem of the movement. The nine verse poem written by Naftali Hertz Ember describing the yearning to return to Israel set to the tune of a work that was unmistakably borrowed from the Czech composer Smetana, still sets our Zionist hearts soaring today. The dream 
name of one person, Theodor Herzl, took on a life of its own. The wave of Zionism grew, the romance of transforming the Jewish people from victim into the masters of their destiny was intoxicating. Jews were responsible for their own protection. Jews were not dependent on anyone for their daily lives. Jews were in charge of Jews. It was life altering, but it wasn't all milk and honey. During the first years of Zionism and during the first years of the creation of the Jewish state, the focus was on survival. While security will always be crucial, always a goal of the Jewish state, the focus of Israel is now on creativity and ingenuity. Israel turns dream into reality. Here's to the next 125 years of Zionist dreams. Being labeled a Zionist is, for me, an honor, a privilege, but not all labels are proudly worn, which leads me to think about some of those other labels. Fascist and Nazi are now labels bandied about with little concern for their true meaning. In fact, I would wager that most people who toss the terms about could never properly define fascism or Nazism or specify who is a fascist or who is a Nazi. Today, these terms are simply used to describe someone with a political view that is other than yours. I think it's time to set the record straight. Today, these terms, the terms are used as an ad hominem attack. And ad hominem attacks are one of the lowest forms of argumentation. The lowest form is name calling, and there is only a smidgen difference between the two. In Latin, where the term comes from, ad hominem means to, or in this case, against the human. The expression is a condensed version of the longer Latin term, argumentum ad hominem, which means the argument to or against the person. Instead of arguing a case against an idea, one reverts to personal attacks against the arguer. As a consequence of that line of argumentation, almost all cases of ad hominem attacks and arguments are fallacious, if only because they do not address the central issue at stake in the argument. They're wrong. The style of argument has been around for centuries. Aristotle was probably the first to identify and attach the name to this form of argumentation. The great philosopher was the first orator to call an attack an attack ad hominem. He described it as attacking the arguer, not the argument. And that was profound. The true purpose of argumentation is to discover and unravel truth, to pursue the best path forward. It's not just to, to prove someone right or wrong, but to come up with better solutions to big problems. Calling a person with whom you disagree either a fascist or a Nazi does not quite obviously further the pursuit of truth. It does not move the dial. Calling someone a name and attacking them and their character is running away from the argument itself. It's using the, a base and ineffective method of argumentation rather than an honest attempt to discover underlying truths. Fascism and Nazism are powerful labels. Fascism and Nazism represent true evil. Fascism and Nazism are responsible for the murder of tens of millions of people. Bantering those labels around, tossing them about to designate your political opposition is an exaggeration. That is an abuse of them in the historical context, that is those terms. It is in fact a form of Holocaust denial. Anyone who truly believes that Donald Trump is like Adolf Hitler and that MAGA Republicans are like Nazis is seriously removed from any sense of historical reality. If you know this, I did not write is Hitler or are Nazis, I wrote like, like Hitler and like Nazis. Trump is a populist. He loves big rallies. That does not make him a Nazi. Populism is a common political tool today. Many, if not most successful politicians use it as a device to educate and convince the voters. The defining trait in populism is distilling complex ideas into simple solutions. As you know, 
this week, Joe Biden came to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to give the most vicious, hateful, and divisive speech ever delivered by an American president, vilifying 75 million citizens, plus another probably 75 to 150, if we want to be accurate about it, as threats to democracy and as enemies of the state. You're all enemies of the state. He's an enemy of the state. You want to know the truth? The enemy of the state is him and the group that control him, which is circling around him. Do this, do that, Joe. You're going to do this, Joe, right? The FBI and the Justice Department have become vicious monsters, controlled by radical left scoundrels, lawyers, and the media, who tell them what to do, you people right there, and when to do it. Populist messages are easy to convey and easy to understand. So in addition to being ad hominem attacks, calling a foe a fascist or a Nazi is also an exploitation of the populism tool. In our schools, our newsrooms, even our corporate boardrooms, there is a new far left fascism that demands absolute allegiance. I think it was uh, disgraceful, disgraceful, that the intelligence agencies allowed any information that turned out to be so false and fake out. I think it's a disgrace. And I say that, and I say that. And that's something that Nazi Germany would have done and did do. I think it's a disgrace. The great social political philosopher Hannah Arendt went to Jerusalem in 1961 she was sent there by the New Yorker to cover the trial of Adolf Eichmann. Entscheidung trägt bzw. getragen hat. Then Arendt sent her reports back as a series of essays, which later became the seminal work on the trial and on Nazism, entitled Eichmann in Jerusalem. In her work, Hannah Arendt describes how Nazism, evil, became banal every day. Having already written a three-part work entitled The Origins of Totalitarianism, in which uh, it was published in 51, her work is widely and universally praised and is probably the most insightful educational tool in the world in understanding fascism and Nazism. And she went to the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem in order to put her theories and analysis to a test. She had a front row seat to see how her theories of the movement of totalitarianism, of Nazism, and of fascism held up to a real-life specimen. Before the war, Eichmann was a vacuum cleaner salesman. Vacuum cleaner salesman. During the war, he was in charge of transportation and logistics. Ultimately, Eichmann was responsible for the transportation that brought millions of Jews to their deaths. This real-life Nazi argued that it was simply a job. He was a single cog in a wheel, one piece in a huge machinery, a factory. Justice and morality proved otherwise. Calling someone with whom you disagree names is immature and reprehensible. Resorting to calling your political debate partners on the other side of the aisle in a democracy is not just wrong. It dilutes the true evil that those words represent. Shame on those who abuse history for personal gain. Coming up next, points of view. First up is a column from the Jerusalem Post that was published on September 2nd, 2022, and the author is Kenneth Brander. Rabbi Brander is the president and Rosh Yeshiva of Or Torah Stone, a modern Orthodox educational network in Israel. Uh, I taught there for many years. Uh, the column is entitled, 125 Years of Modern Religious Zionism, Time for an Introspective Opinion. This is an excellent look and evaluation of modern religious Zionism and how uh, things have progressed. This is how the column begins. The occasion of the 125th anniversary of the First Zionist Congress is a cause for both celebration and introspection for all Zionists. As a member of the religious Zionist community, allow me to use that perspective to reflect upon this auspicious occasion. Our achievements over the past century and a quarter have surpassed the dreams of even the most ambitious visionaries. They are nothing short of a miraculous manifestation of our prophet's far-sighted aspirations. Yet, in this month of reflection and introspection, we must admit that the course of our movement demands adjustments and even new directions. 
if we are to fully embrace the ideas upon which religious Zionism is based. Rabbi Brander now lists some of the great achievements of Israel and religious Zionism. He writes, The state of Israel today is a bastion of technological, academic, cultural, and spiritual accomplishments, and we are blessed to live in a land that is simultaneously the startup nation and home to the largest amount of Torah study for men and women in the world. These accomplishments are a source of immeasurable importance and of practical and religious significance. The religious Zionist community has played a major role in the nation building process, arguably far larger than most might have believed possible 125 years ago. Brander points out that Israel created institutions and ideas, transformed the Jew and the world, and explains that diaspora Jewry has suffered while Israeli Jewry has flourished. And that is a conundrum and a problem that needs to be confronted. He writes, however, these demographic trends are also a contributing factor to a tragic loss of many diaspora Jews to assimilation. In response, Zionism also calls upon us to be a spiritual lifeline to the world. Jewry, something that has achieved through the Jewish Agency and several NGOs, including Or Torah Stone's Baron and Strauss Amiel program, dispatching hundreds of emissaries around the world intent on strengthening those local communities as well as their bonds with Israel. In this arena of emissaries, there is still so much more to be done. Demand far exceeds Israel's ability to supply enough proper emissaries. Brander concludes by bringing the whole thing together, and he writes, these messages must again be embraced so that we can get back to the basics, Jewish unity and common purpose that defined the early decades of religious Zionism. If we succeed in that regard, we can be wholly confident that the ancient and modern visions of the land of peace and security, spirituality, and the united Jewish people serving as a beacon of light to the rest of society can become a reality. This is an excellent piece by Kenneth Brander, Rabbi Brander. Thank you so much. Next up is a column from the Times of Israel blog. It was published on September 4th, 2022, and is entitled, Am I a Friar? Subtitled, I think everyone feels the pinch, working more for the same pay, spending more for fewer groceries and shabbier services, but maybe I'm the only sucker. This is a humorous column, and it is written by Jason Frederick Gilbert. I love humor, and I think it's a very important and essential for us to laugh. Very, very important to laugh at ourselves. And uh, laughing at ourselves is a form of self-critique. A leader needs that quality. Certainly great leaders need it. Friar in Hebrew means sucker. It's a slang word. This column is a bit of insider baseball. Those of us who have been to Israel will probably chuckle a little more and have an aha moment or two when I read some of the pieces. All in all, it's an enjoyable look at life in Israel today. This is how Gilbert begins. One of my favorite sayings in Hebrew translates loosely as, the owner has lost his or her mind. I suspect it was more popular in the 80s when mental health jokes were as acceptable as ones about Georgians and fatsos and blondes. But you could still hear it occasionally today. The phrase refers to a blowout sale in which the prices are so low and the profit margin so slim that the owner of the establishment running this type of sale seems to have lost their mind for considering it good business. It does, however, give the customer a false sense that they're not friars, suckers all the while taking advantage of this mentally unfit owner. Ethics aside, it's a heck of a marketing tactic because no one, absolutely no one, wants to be a friar. He continues, I'm paying for more but getting less at the supermarket. The owner really has lost his or her mind. No one will go back to Supersol, Yonaf, or Rami Levy if the price is ah, I forgot. It's all a monopoly of five companies, Osem, Coca-Cola, Strauss, Unilever, etc. That basically run out the competition and fixed prices. I have a choice, 
but it's a Henry Ford choice. I can have any color I want as long as it's Red Bamba by Osem. Five for 21 shekels. Silly me. I'm forgetting about the time, not so long ago, perhaps, possibly even 2016, when there was an actual human person helping you bag your groceries. No, that position no longer exists in most places. I wonder what happened to those baggers. I'm sure their exorbitant minimum wage salaries were cut for the overall health of the company. Oh, wait, you have a cashier? Most supermarkets today have reduced staff and replaced them with automated scanning machines. Now I'm actually working for the supermarket, scanning the items, bagging them myself, paying for the bags too, and by the looks of it, paying more for the same items. Now Gilbert introduces humorous examples of travel and renewing your passport in Israel. I'm paying more for services and accepting lower standards. Staffing shortages have wreaked havoc on any attempt to get anything done or go anywhere, like travel. If you've tried to renew your passport lately, you've surely noticed the three to six month wait time required to get an appointment in the Ministry of the Interior. But you're nobody's fool. You look up appointments in other cities and finally decide that Kiryat Shmona isn't that far away. So you pack up the family for a fun day of renewing passports in Kiryat Shmona. When you get to the airport, you realize that there aren't nearly enough people working there to handle the line snaking all the way to Netanya. And even if you did make it on time for your flight, chances are your suitcase won't. Or, as I experienced in the recent trip to the Netherlands, instead of one bag, I got 3,000 smaller pieces of one. Thanks, EasyJet. Or, you can self-check, self-check prior to the flight. Print out the stickers, ask yourself security questions, learn how to fly the plane, serve yourself an overpriced bottle of water from the Sky Mall, and land it. Voila! Gilbert concludes by simply wishing that he had solutions. I wish I had the clever suggestions on how to improve things here in Israel. Maybe I just need to accept the harsh truth that for as long as I live here in this country, I'll always be a friar. Coming up, commentary through cartoons where pictures tell the story. I want to show you five cartoons and memes today. The first meme is very funny. It reads, I was thrown out of the break room at my Walmart yesterday. They asked me what I was doing there. I told them I was on break. They said, you don't work here. I said, I'd just finished using the self-check, so I clearly do. <laughs> That's exactly connected to Gilbert's column. Next up is a play on the nuclear launch series and all of our automated devices that are voice activated. The cartoon is called Enunciation Apocalypse. The general shouts, no, Alexa, I said order lunch. That's hilarious. The next cartoon is a play on one of the most famous of all tales. Outside the emergency room, a doctor is speaking to the mother of a patient. The doctor says, Mrs. Jacobs, your son was in an accident. I'm sorry. He's, he's, he's wearing dirty underwear. And she's on the ground, hitting the ground and shouting, no, no, why, why, why? <laughs> that was always the big fear, dirty underwear. Everyone has experienced this. It's the classic reality, a, a picture of a very large sharp stone and the caption reads, the stone when it's in your shoe. The next picture is a tiny, tiny pebble and the caption reads, the stone when you finally get it out. Finally, this last meme makes fun of some of ubiquitous expiration dates. The salt container reads, 280 million years of salt expires in three years. Some things never expire, like good humor. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. Israeli Prime Minister Yair Lapid explained that Israel is carrying out a correct policy ahead of the U.S. administration's intentions to return to the Iranian nuke deal. In Jerusalem, at the start of the weekly cabinet meeting, Lapid said, and I'm quoting here, our policy this past year has been to apply pressure, 
but not bring about a crisis in relations with the U.S. by presenting American officials with credible intelligence, unquote. Come what may, it is Israel that will have to deal with Iran and its bomb. And it should be clear to everyone that Israel is flying solo on the issue of Iran. Neither the United States nor the rest of the world is concerned about Iran's nuclear potential. They just want a deal. There is very little doubt that when necessary, Israel will launch a surgical strike on Iran's nuclear arsenal and manufacturing capabilities. Israel bombed Aleppo airport in the areas around it recently. The bomb strike was reported by Sana, Syrian state news. The strike caused damage to the airport, which has been temporarily shut down. Aleppo is in northern Syria, very close to the Turkish-Syrian border. Damascus, on the other hand, is in southern Syria, very close to the Israeli-Syrian border. Why would Israel bomb the Aleppo airport? The answer is that Iran is using the Aleppo airport as its base of operations to import weapons and supplies needed to manufacture weapons. One of the destroyed factories near the airport was a missile factory. Most of the parts in that factory were imported from Iran and the missiles themselves were assembled in Aleppo. For the second time in two months, Iranian media reported that their security forces arrested 12 individuals belonging to the Baha'i faith in the northern part of the country. Baha'i has been outlawed in Iran. Members have been persecuted in Iran since they established themselves as an offshoot of Islam. Followers of this faith are accused of supporting Israel and undermining the Iranian regime. There is such antipathy from the government of Iran towards Baha'i that in Iran it is neither illegal to persecute nor to kill those who are Baha'i members. This next piece is a shocker. It's a news item that stunned me. For the first time ever, the IDF authorized the Iranian opposition television channel called Iran International entrance to the Iron Dome base and granted the channel permission to speak with the base commanders and soldiers. During the visit, the IDF commander told an Iranian correspondent that the Iron Dome is only part of Israel's defense system, which includes four different systems that can protect Israeli skies from short and long-range missiles from Hezbollah and Iran. There really was a logic behind this unique move. Israeli leadership knows that the ruling regime in Iran monitors the opposition channel. This was an opportunity to send a clear message to the leaders of Iran, illustrating Israel's military ingenuity and creativity. Alcohol is forbidden according to Muslim law, but attendees at the much anticipated upcoming World Cup, which will be held in Qatar, have received dispensation of sorts. Qatar will permit ticketed fans to buy alcoholic beer at World Cup soccer matches starting three hours before the kickoff for one hour after the final whistle blows, but not during the match. This information comes from a source, we are told, that has knowledge of the plans for the tournament. According to the source, Budweiser is a major World Cup sponsor with exclusive rights to sell beer at the tournament, and they will serve the beer within the ticketed perimeter surrounding each stadium but Budweiser will not be serving beer in the stadium stands or in the concourse. This year's World Cup is the first to be held in a Muslim country. The event, which is both sponsored by major beer brands like Budweiser and attended by many fans who happen to be avid beer drinkers, posed a new set of problems for the World Games organizers. They seem to be working it out and working out the kinks in this system. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. We were speaking about the word friar earlier as part of the Jason Frederick Gilbert column from the Times of Israel. As I mentioned, the word friar means sucker in slang. Hebrew. Most Israelis have a fear, a real fear of being a friar. They often define it as doing something that someone else would have done. You were a friar to do it. 
Did you know that the word friar actually originates from Yiddish? Surprised? It was borrowed and brought into the modern Hebrew slang. In Yiddish, the word means free. Friar means free. The Yiddish term was originally used pejoratively. It referred to Jews who were non-observant. They were friar because they were free of halachic obligations and requirements of orthodoxy. The word was picked up and it integrated into Hebrew slang, and that's when the meaning changed dramatically. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Micah Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. Mm-hmm.